Hello everybody and welcome to the next part of the serial killer iceberg. Same as with the last video in this series, there is a lot to go into with all these and a lot of the details are too cool not to talk about or should I say too messed up or gross or cool in a weird way I guess. So this video is going to be a comprehensive look at tier 5 of the iceberg. One announcement I want to say off the bat before we get started is I am proud to announce that I have started a second YouTube channel known as Wind Gaming, specifically for the purpose of playing video games. I like video games a lot, especially playing horror games, and it's really fun whenever I do them on stream. However, I can't really play a bunch of games on this channel as it doesn't really meld with the content and some people don't like it and some people really want to see it, so I just made a separate channel for all of that. It's got one video up on it right now, although of course there will be more in the future, and I intend to play horror games as well as story let's plays and things similar to that. Thank you all so much to the already 7,000 subscribers that I have on that channel at the time of recording this. 7,000 people who subscribed either as soon as or before any content was posted and you guys are fantastic and it really means a lot to see that kind of support. It will be the second link in the description so please go down there check it out and I hope you enjoy. Without further ado we are going to go ahead and get into it but as always thank you for watching. Samuel Little was an active serial killer for over 35 years leading up to his arrest in 2005. He confessed to a total of 93 murders with 60 of those murders being confirmed which for those keeping score is the record in the United States. The majority of Samuel's crimes were sexually motivated. As a young boy he said he developed an affinity for women's necks after while he was in kindergarten he saw his teacher rub her neck one day and that just flipped a switch in his brain. And throughout his teen years he began to collect true crime novels and books that had depictions of men strangling women. This started him down a violent path of assault that began to culminate into other crimes and eventually murder. By the time of his final arrest in 2005, Samuel had been arrested for DUI, fraud, shoplifting, solicitation, armed robbery, aggravated assault, rape, and of course the murder. What was especially terrifying to me about Samuel is watching his tapes, he seems like one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. Of course at the time of his arrest he's a senior citizen, but every single interview he does it feels like just a grandpa telling a story and this is even something the interrogators mentioned. He would talk casually about what the weather was like, what he was doing that day, and the way any older relative would tell you a story about their childhood and then he'll just throw in the detail of who he murdered and how he did it. Not only that, but he remembered very specific details about all of the women, all of the details of what they looked like, how they behaved, and where he eventually left the body. And like I said, it's doubly creepy because if you take his descriptions of these girls out of context and just play them as is, it sounds exactly like some veteran from the war talking about a woman he fell in love with overseas like there's this weird nostalgic reminiscence to it and then you add on the last like minute where he's like but yeah i killed her and dumped her in the lake but she was pretty it's what make cases like this particularly disturbing because it really highlights the whole it could be anyone ideology another detail about him is he was incredibly squeamish around the sight of blood which is why all of the killings he did were strangulations which also the whole neck thing i mentioned earlier but he also did things like drowning and beating people to death this is again because he was squeamish around the sight of blood but it also turned out to be very beneficial to him down the line because he never really left a ton of DNA evidence anytime he killed somebody. In one story of a time that he was almost arrested and caught for the murders was whenever he had a dead body in his back seat uh, parked on the side of the road and a police car pulled up and as the cop was getting out of his car he climbed into the back seat and then came out the side door and started zipping up his pants to make it look like he was just with a woman. So whenever the cops there with the flashlight, he's like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And Samuel says, oh, you know, me and my wife are just fooling around. So the cop walks up to the window, shines the light directly on the body, staring into the face of the woman in there. Samuel says, well, she may be a little drunk. And the cop says, all right. You kids get out of here. Which it's so harrowing to think that he was that close to getting stopped in the murder of his killing spree 
but it just got away. By the time of his arrest, Samuel had served a total of 10 years in jail with over 100 arrests, even once being tried for a murder that it was later figured out he did commit. However, he got off at that first trial. A.M. Samuel died of natural causes while in prison last year in 2020. Rodney Alcala, also known as the Dating Game Killer, which we'll explain the name in a second, committed at least seven murders from 1977 to 1979. Although in my opinion, like we'll see, I think there were way more than that. Rodney's criminal record began when while living in California, he had abducted and abused an eight year old girl. He did this by kidnapping her off the side of the road and bringing her to his apartment, which other kids saw and called the police. When the police got there, the eight year old girl was still alive, although very horribly abused, and little known at the time, Rodney had escaped to New York and changed his name. It was shortly after this that the FBI began putting out pictures of Rodney and even moved him to the top 10 most wanted list. During this time, Rodney had gotten a counseling job at a school in New Hampshire, until one day one of the students at the school saw the poster from the FBI recognized it as their counselor and had him arrested. It was found out years later that Rodney had actually committed a murder during that time that he was a counselor and living under an alias. After being extradited back to California, however, the eight-year-old girl's parents would not allow her to testify and relive the event, so Rodney pretty much got off with a basic assault charge. He served two years for that, got out of jail, almost immediately was arrested for assaulting a 13 year old girl he gave a ride to school went back to jail for only another two years and then got out again it was during this time that the crime spree started what rodney would do is he would approach these young boys and girls and tell them that he was a photographer he would say he does several adult photo shoots and would have them pose provocatively so that he could take pictures of them so provocatively in fact that the fbi has since posted the pictures so that people can identify missing loved ones however they have not posted 90 percent of them as according to them they are far too explicit it's from these pictures and the bodies that were discovered later that the seven confirmed deaths came to be however in the literal thousands of pictures that rodney had there are several people who have never been identified and henceforth never found. So there's a solid chance a lot of people that he took these pictures of didn't make it. The reason he's referred to as the dating game killer is because at the height of his murder spree, he went on the game show called The Dating Game. In the show, several bachelors answer several questions about a bachelorette and one of them gets to go on a date with her. Everyone was incredibly freaked out by Rodney, with another contestant saying he had some very weird opinions about things, which I can only imagine what that means. And Rodney won the episode, however the girl would not go on a date with him. Him, saying that he was far too creepy. The way he was finally caught is that shortly after one of the girls disappeared and then her body was found later, a man drew a sketch for police that very closely resembled Rodney. Rodney's parole officer recognized it, got warrants to search Rodney's stuff, and upon searching his apartment, found that woman's earrings. And then after he was arrested, a very stupid series of events happened with the trial. The first trial got thrown out because they said the witnesses weren't properly informed of previous crimes. The second trial was also thrown out because someone was hypnotized as one of the witnesses and that was considered faulty or whatever. So the third trial finally got started in 2010. And then, and I'm not kidding here, Rodney decided to be his own defense attorney. And at one point, called himself to the stand so he interrogated himself as himself being both the interrogator and the interrogatee to which he referred to himself as mr alcala and spoke in a deeper voice when being the attorney so this guy in trial for his own murder literally stood up and went mr alcala did you commit the murders and then he would turn and go, no, I did not. Well, you are a very handsome man. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Alcala. You're welcome, Mr. Alcala. <laughs> to which his chief argument 
was that he didn't remember committing the murders, so therefore he couldn't have committed them. I should also mention that that specific interrogation portion went on for five hours. <laughs> and during the closing statements, Rodney simply played the entirety of the song Alice's Restaurant on a boombox, which is about the protagonist of the song wanting to kill someone. <laughs> which, I, I guess he saved money on the defense attorney, but you get what you pay for. A specifically damning piece of information that came during the trial is, remember that eight-year-old girl that started the whole crime spree? Well, she came back after 42 years to testify at this third and final trial. Rodney was given the death penalty and is still alive on death row to this day. Eric Edgar Cook was convicted of killing eight people from 1958 to 1963. Eric was born with a cleft lip, which he later got surgery to fix. However, he suffered from several more facial deformities as he aged due to severe injuries brought on by beatings and factory accidents. Despite being transferred to several different schools he was constantly bullied for his appearance by several other students and he also wasn't exactly the brightest from testimonies of those who knew him and many believe that's what contributed to his main streak attitude starting off on a very high note one of his first notable crimes is that when he was 17 Edgar burnt down a church he went to because they didn't let him join the choir. Despite this mean streak, Edgar married and ended up having seven kids with his wife, and at the same time sort of moonlit as a weird sort of random crime criminal. See, this was Australia in the late 50s, and apparently it was common for people to just leave their keys in their unlocked car. So Edgar would look around for cars at night, get in them, start them, go on his joy rides and then park them back and the owners were never the wiser to it. It was during these late night joy rides that his murders and other crimes took place. Pretty much he would just drive a random car around and then see a house he liked, run inside, steal a bunch of stuff and leave. Or just attack people on the side of the road or just get into traffic accidents or whatever, he was just a loser. The methods in which he killed his victims included choking, stabbing, shooting, and hitting them with a car. And because of the seemingly random acts of violence, which it pretty much was, it took a long time for police to connect that these were all the same people. Edgar would also do bizarre things, like for example, one time he murdered a woman in her house and then just spent hours sitting in the living room, drinking their lemonade, and just chilling out and then another time he got really drunk and he dragged a woman that he had just killed into the neighbor's yard assaulted her body and just left it there the way they eventually caught edgar is after he had killed someone by shooting them he had ditched the gun in a bush off the side of the road the police while investigating the murder found the gun took it to a forensics lab, confirmed that it was in fact the gun, and then put it back in the bush with a string attached to it. So then the police just staked out the area for a couple days, and sure enough, one night, Edgar comes back to get his gun, although because they tied it, it's tangled up in the bush, and he sat there fighting it long enough for the police to arrest him. It's there that he confessed to the eight murders, as well as over 250 robberies, which Edgar remembered every single amount of money or article stolen down to the penny for every single robbery. To the point they could give him a specific date, like March 10th, 1958, and he would say, oh yeah, a brown coat, $39.48. So I'm not sure if he was actually dumb, like a lot of people said, or if he just had a really good memory or what. I mean, not that I really care, the dude deserved what he got anyway, but whatever. And Edgar was hanged for his crimes in 1964. Bell Gunnis, or Guinness, I'm not sure which way that name goes, is known for murdering at least 14 people from 1884 to 1908. However, I'm pretty sure the actual number is more like 40. See, Belle liked money a lot. Investigators later on said that she was very greedy and sort of hoarded her wealth. And this love of money became evident after in the same day, her house and her candy shop, both of which she co-owned with her husband, burnt to the ground, to which immediately they collected the insurance payments for, which Belle liked a lot, and this was seemingly the spark that led to all of her future crimes. It started after two of her children 
died of lower intestinal inflammation. Now, this was the 1880s, so it's not like you could do a full spread autopsy with a medical examiner like you could do today. However, it is known that a lot of poisons lead to intestinal inflammation, so there's a good chance. And the reason I say there's a good chance is because she had immediately taken out insurance on both of the babies and then cashed out immediately after they died. To make it especially interesting, none of her neighbors have ever reported that they saw her pregnant. And then, not too long after that, her husband dies of a supposed hemorrhage. But not only did he die of a hemorrhage, he died on the day that his insurance policy expired and coincidentally, a new one started. Meaning he died in the correct 24 hour time frame for her to take out both policies. Which if you're curious, those two policies came out to $5,000 total, which in 1880 was a lot of money. Doing some basic math with an inflation calculator, it's about 133,000 by today's standards. She then remarried to a man who had a baby with him, the baby died again, to which, of course, she took out the insurance money. And then that husband suspiciously died after a meat grinder fell onto his head from the top shelf, crushing his skull and killing him. To which she got about 3000 from that policy. At this point, the police and doctors were getting suspicious of her, so she decided it was time to leave town and move out to the countryside. However, she would leave ads up around the city saying that she has a bunch of property which she bought with suspiciously acquired money and that she's looking for a new husband. So men would write to her, she'd invite them to come, however, they always had to bring money. <laughs> as a down payment on the wedding, I guess. And none of those men were ever seen again, which is why the number has to be way closer to 40. This went on for a while until in 1908, the brother of one of the men who went courting Bell had told his brother that, hey, I'm going to go to this lady's house, just so you know, and then the family never heard from him again. After that, brother wrote a letter to the residents saying that he was going to come look for his brother, the house suspiciously burnt down. Bell was supposedly killed in this fire because they found the bodies of Bell, or supposedly Bell, and her children in the rubble, which Bell had a couple kids that she hadn't killed for insurance money, at least didn't have the chance to. And during the investigation of the property, police found 14 bodies buried on the grounds, which is where the 14 figure comes from. The reason they believe that Bell died in the fire is because they found the body of a woman who was headless for some reason in the house fire itself. However, the body was at least five inches shorter than how tall Bell was to be reported and about 50 pounds lighter. Not to mention, why did she lose her head in a house fire? That didn't stop the papers from saying that this was Belle's body and that she's dead. To add to it, a farmhand who Belle had an on-again, off-again affair with said that Belle came to him and told him that the brother of one of her victims was coming to visit. And the farmhand who had been an accomplice in several of her crimes by killing men and disposing of the bodies was told to kill a nearby woman, throw her body in the house, burn it all down while she escapes out of the country. So I think it's pretty clear that Belle didn't die there. However, she's never been found because the official story was she died in the fire. There was never a big investigation to find her. So she simply just disappeared, which I mean, she's probably dead now since, you know, she'd have to be like 160 years old to still be alive. But just on the off chance she is, Belle, if you're out there right now, I hate you. Gary Heidnick killed two people from 1986 to 1987, and I know just hearing that number you may be thinking, oh, well just two, that's not a lot compared to the others, but um, just wait till we get to the details of it. Gary Heidnick was hailed as being a very bright kid at a young age, and even tested with an IQ of 148. However, he certainly acted like it and had a narcissistic personality, as he told several kids his age that they were simply not worthy to speak to him. During high school, he joined the military, but was shortly afterwards honorably discharged after he was diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder. He spent a long time in and out of mental institutions during this, 
before getting out and deciding to turn his ideas towards investments. Basically, he found a local Methodist church that he said he could do the accounting through, and through basic investments, he turned a bank account and a church that started out with only five people when he found it into a massive church amassing $500,000. However, he had no care for religion or the church itself. He just saw a group of people that he could take advantage of and use as a foundation in order to start making money. Shortly after marrying a woman that he had only communicated with by mail in the Philippines, she divorced him after finding him in bed with with three other women, to which after the event she found him, he would start making her watch. And then other times he would abuse her and do a bunch of other mean things to her, so she left him. He ended up having a total of three kids, one with the aforementioned wife, and two with other random hookups that he had. One of those children was his first brush in with the law because the woman that he had the child with was a very mentally ill woman um, that he had checked out of a essentially assisted living home for the mentally disabled. So he comes, he checks her out as someone who knows her, does that with her, she ends up getting pregnant, he gets found out and gets a slap on the wrist basically for doing it. It was after this that the real horror started. Gary kidnapped five women and put them in a sort of makeshift torture pit that he had constructed in his basement. In this pit, he would do all means of physical torture to them and psychological torture, including things like electrocution and cutting and stabbing. And in one case, one of the survivors mentioned that he would take a screwdriver and shove it in there until they couldn't hear, which is brutal. It was during one of these torture sessions that one of the women died of supposedly shock. Uh, so he took her body, dismembered it, and then placed it in bags in the fridge labeled as dog food. To which the night that the whole dismemberment occurred, police were actually called to the house because of the foul odor, to which Gary answered the door and said, oh sorry, I've got a pig cooking and I let it burn too long and the police just waved him goodnight and left. The other one of his murder victims died after he had filled the bottom part of the pit with water and then took an electric cord and threw it in there to electrocute them and one of them died of shock, like literal shock. Gary was eventually caught after one of his victims tricked him. See, after that lady had died of the electric shock, he took another one of the younger, less damaged looking victims out in order for her to try to find a new victim to lure to the car for him to kidnap. And this specific girl appealing to his ego said, well, my parents are probably gonna send the police looking because I've been gone for a couple weeks. Why don't you let me go call them at a payphone so they don't bother us? To which as soon as she got to the payphone, she immediately called the police. The police showed up, arrested Gary, and then figured out everything he was doing. To which during the initial questioning, Gary <laughs> said, that the women in the basement he was torturing were there whenever he bought the house. Which has got to be, and again, it's so brutal and evil what he did, but it has to be one of the funniest defenses I've ever heard. Literally, the police are like, all these tortured people, you do that? And he's like, that, that was there when I got here. <laughs> During his trial, he took the insanity plea, which was actually rejected because of the church fund thing that I mentioned earlier. Because as the prosecution said, someone who's so insane wouldn't know how to build up $500,000 in a church fund. And Gary was sentenced to death and given the lethal injection in 1999. Richard Kuklinski, also known as the Iceman, which is way too cool of a name for a killer, is confirmed to have killed five people leading up to his arrest in 1986. However, he claims that the number's closer to 200. Um, we'll get to that. Richard's criminal career began in the 1960s when he began selling bootleg copies of Disney films, which we can all see is the very clearly set Disney to murder pipeline, before figuring out that it was much more profitable to sell prints of adult movies. Throughout everything I'm going to mention, I want you to keep in mind that Richard was only ever arrested once before the murder arrest 
for a bad check, which he didn't do any jail time for because he just paid it off. The first man he killed, he shot to death while selling tapes, supposedly because the deal went bad, and simply stuffed his body in an oil drum and ditched it. The second was a pharmacist. See, one of the jobs that Richard did was he collected stolen goods and then sold them as his own sort of like storefront black market. And a pharmacist had been pushing pills on him to sell at his shop and Richard didn't want to do it. And then after going to meet Richard one day, Richard killed the pharmacist. For a long time, it was figured out by investigators later that Richard ran a crime ring with four other criminals. Around the time the investigations began of him and his accomplices, Richard got paranoid and killed one of the members of his inner ring. He did this by feeding his accomplice a cyanide laced hamburger and then having him and another one of his friends hide the body. He then killed that partner who helped him move the body, afraid that he would snitch over the original murder. It was during this time that a body was found in the middle of the woods by police, who upon examination had ice crystals inside of the actual corpse. What that means is that the body had been in a freezer for a very long time before getting dumped. It was later figured out that the body had in fact been in a freezer for 15 months before Richard got paranoid that they were gonna look for the body there, so he decided to ditch it so long after the actual murder occurred. This is what got him the nickname of the Iceman. And in order to shut down Richard, a big undercover investigation was launched with the FBI and the ATF in order to stop him. So an undercover agent who had been undercover for 18 months became close with Richard and then sure enough one day Richard asked for cyanide. That undercover agent asked Richard to carry out a hit for him using the cyanide, which of course wasn't real cyanide. So on his way to do the hit, Richard got to thinking maybe that guy's not legit, so he feeds the cyanide to a stray dog that he passes by, and the dog doesn't do anything, so he's like, I think that guy was lying to me. <laughs> so he tries to go back home knowing the whole thing's a sting, but gets arrested anyway. He got arrested and was eventually sentenced to prison for life, or 111 years, which, same thing. And it was after he was arrested that the stories got absurd. For example, he claimed, as I mentioned earlier, that he's killed like 200 people. He says that he just kills homeless people for fun all the time by shooting them or poisoning them or whatever else. He said that he personally knew John Gotti and that John Gotti personally commissioned him on several of the hits that he performed. He said that he was closely tied with all five families of New York, which is a big thing in the mafia and that he would perform hits on the five families and then perform a hit for that family against the family he just performed the hit for, and even claimed that he himself murdered Jimmy Hoffa. And while there's some connections, like people have really dug into his reports and been like, well, he was seen with this guy, so maybe this murder's legit. So there may be a few extra murders, but the degree in which he claimed to be would have made him like the most prolific gangster ever bar none and this is the guy who got arrested because he almost tried to kill someone with fake cyanide so i don't think it's that legit richard died in 2006 of a heart attack which his wife had signed a do not resuscitate order for on him because I mean, of course she did. And interestingly enough, Richard was played by Michael Shannon in a movie titled The Iceman, which is a story about the events of his life, or at least the supposed events of his life. Arthur Shower Ross, also known as the Genesee River Killer, killed 14 people from 1972 to 1989. Arthur was cited at a young age as having very low intelligence and never succeeded well in school and also was involved in several, um, how do I put this? Relationships with people he shouldn't have relationships with, as in immediate family, which I'm sure had a very positive effect on his mental well-being as he got older. He was drafted into the Vietnam War and had several stories afterwards of how he used to like be in these violent combat scenarios and how he used to skin and decapitate people and how cool he was but it turns out later that he never saw combat and was simply stationed behind the lines. And it was shortly after he got back to the States that he got in a lot of trouble for arson, to which a psychiatrist later said that he was a sort of sexual arsonist, which is a phrase that I never thought I'd say on this channel, but I guess I should have known better. Basically, he would start these fires because they got him 
started. And in total, he served 22 months in prison for those arson events. Not long after this, Arthur was arrested after it came out that he had assaulted and killed two young children ages 8 and 10. However, he got the charge down to a manslaughter plea. The reason for this being, although he had confessed, uh, there wasn't a ton of evidence linking it to it, and you may be thinking, well, isn't a confession enough? But according to the judge and the attorneys, he was so dumb that a confession didn't mean anything. And not only that, the prosecution was certain that if he is put on trial, the jury will feel sympathy for how dumb he is, and therefore will get the charge down to manslaughter anyway, so they might as well plea on it. So he was given parole after only being in jail for 14 years for the murder of two children, and then immediately murdered 12 more people. These were mostly sex workers that he would approach and then hire and then strangle and ditch their body somewhere. The way he was caught is <laughs> while police were investigating a recent place that they found the body, he just walked up to, like, at the bridge above where the body was dumped and just peed over it. So they go up there to ask him and then just figure out, supposedly by his own confession, that he was the one that dumped the body. And at trial, his argument was that he is not guilty by reason of insanity because of the PTSD that he suffered from Vietnam. So then they had several of the larger scale commanders who are familiar with his operation come in and testify that this dude never saw combat and has no idea what he's talking about. And Arthur died in 2008 while in prison of a heart attack. Joseph D'Angelo is guilty of at least 13 murders from 1973 to 1986. Joseph specifically went on three separate murder sprees across three different areas of California to the point that it was believed that these events were done by three different killers. Eventually, once investigators began to put together that this was all one person, he was given the name of the Golden State Killer. Also interesting note, whenever they thought it was three different killers, one of those aliases was called the Night Stalker before the actual Night Stalker that we know now. So whenever they figured out it was all the Golden State Killer, they then re-adopted the name as soon as Richard Ramirez became a killer. Just Interesting fact. Joseph was in the military before becoming a police officer. However, he was kicked off the force for stealing a hammer for some reason. And then after being fired, threatened the life of the chief of police who fired him. Initially, his crime started off as thievery. In several occasions, he would literally steal piggy banks. Like there was several times that he would walk by like expensive jewelry and stuff like that and steal things like pocket change. And I'm not kidding, like actual piggy banks. The first known murder is when he was kidnapping a girl while walking out of the family house and her father heard, came downstairs to stop him. He shot the father and ran away to which the father died. It's not long after this that his crimes became much more extreme. What he would normally do is he would break into the houses of young married couples with a gun and then force the woman to tie up the man and blindfold him to which he would then tie up the woman's hands and mouth and abuse her in a number of intense ways for hours on end. During this time, he would simply eat the food that they had made, drink the stuff out of their fridge, and just walk around the house casually, coming back to the woman to repeatedly abuse her. He would also do these really demented things, like sort of mind games. For example, he would take dishes, and he would lay the men flat on their back and stack the dishes on their back, and say that if he hears the dishes move, in other words, the man trying to get up, uh, he'll kill both of them. He did this 50 times. Like, no joke, this guy broke into houses, did this whole like six hour charade, tying people up and abusing them and all of that 50 times and only had a hiccup on the 50th time. That hiccup was while getting away, two people saw him, to which he pulled his gun and shot both of them. After this, I guess he was kind of off his game and then tried to do the same break-in thing again, only this time the couple managed to get away. So after that, he killed the couple every single time he did it. Getting information out of him was hard and pulling teeth, but they know that there were at least five other instances that he broke into a house, did the whole thing, and killed the couple. Although, there's probably more that he just didn't talk about. Also, during this entire thing, he was sending letters to the local newspapers and police, and he would even do really creepy stuff like call the house that he was about to rob, 
by calling them and then they'd answer and he'd say this is the wrong number and then he'd start talking about stuff he's going to do to the women and the people was like oh this is a weird prank call and then he'd bust in and do it once dna testing became a big thing the killing stopped however of course they were still looking for him which means there was like a 30 year gap between him stopping the killings and him actually getting arrested for it and his neighbors in that time said that he was like the worst person they ever met he would call them threatening to kill them if their dog barked too much he would always yell at the neighbors and had a horribly kept house pretty much this guy was awful and he never learned anything in 2018 he was finally arrested to which his defense was he had a split personality and the other personality jerry was in his head telling him to commit these acts see issue being because the statute of limitations they couldn't charge him for all of the assaults and kidnappings but they could get him on the murders so he took a plea deal on the murders gave the police the details and is currently serving a life sentence to this day however while researching he was more recently moved to protective custody which if you don't know protective custody is traditionally a whole lot more laid back than regular prison so this piece of filth murders so many people and then hurts so many more and then gets 30 years to be free and continue being a jerk and is now setting cozy in some sort of cushy cell where he may have youtube and is able to watch this video right now so um joseph d'angelo i hate you david parker ray is suspected of killing up to 60 people from 1950 to 1999. He was known as the toy box killer because of his horrifying saw trap contraption that we're gonna talk about. As a very young child, David's father, who was an alcoholic, would give him several masochist adult magazines. And David said from that point on, he became obsessed with the fantasy of tying up and torturing women. So he constructed a trailer truck that in the trailer of it had a massive torture room full of chairs and all kinds of gadgets and gizmos to list a few of the things that were recovered from the back of the trailer there were chains whips straps clamps scalpels shock devices saws diagrams syringes and toys and i'll let your imagination go with the toy thing what he would do is kidnap women by a variety of different means sometimes he would pose to be an authority figure in order to get them to come check out something in the trailer or other times simply pick up women off the side of the road before heavily drugging them until they were in a very non-combative state and then putting them back there where he would spend the next few days just yeah some weird details about it is he put mirrors on the ceiling of the trailer because he said he wanted them to always see exactly what he was doing. And his wife helped him get these women and even participated in the abuse, as well as several of his friends who he would have come over and they would take turns. And then he had a device set up um, in order for his dog. Anyway, the way he was finally caught is when one day a young girl was approached by him pretending to be a police officer saying she needs to come check something out. He throws her in the trailer and he starts to abduct her. That day David had to go to work and this potential victim be found a way to get out of her chains to which the only person in the trailer was David's wife. The young girl managed to stab David's wife and got away and then ran down the road to get help wearing nothing but an iron collar and the chain garment that she had attached to her. She then got to a house to which she got a phone, called the police, and David and his wife were arrested. It was after this that a woman came forward saying that she was also a victim of Ray. However, she had reported it as soon as she got away and the police just didn't believe her that there was this guy driving around with a makeshift torture trailer abducting people. And another woman got away who was also kidnapped by Ray. However, after two days of torture, Ray thought he killed her, so he ditched her on the side of the road. She wasn't dead, she was alive, wakes up, went home to her family, to which her husband thought she was lying and had actually been in an affair and made up this whole story about a serial killer with a torture machine in the back of a trailer, that he divorced her, which I hope that guy feels awful about it later. See, the reason only three women ended up remembering enough to come forward is because David had them drugged for one during the whole event, so they were already had a foggy recollection, but after he ditched them somewhere, he would give them an, an amnestic 
so that they forgot a lot of what happened. There are several women who have came forward in years after believing that they were victims of Ray. However, the entire thing at the time just seemed like a dream. But whenever they saw it on the news and heard the details, they began to remember more and more aspects and it became real. After a lot of questioning, what they eventually got Ray on is that Ray killed one of his partners who helped him with the whole kidnapping and torturing of women because supposedly that, she, that he was gonna snitch and then another one of his partners had killed his wife who was also gonna snitch so ray did the whole torture thing with her and then killed her so they managed to get him on two murders not only that but in investigation ray had filmed one of the times that he did it and of course the woman was never identified afterwards so they at least got that as an abuse situation uh if not missing person suspected murder you know the bit and ray never really talked about anything so yeah while it was at least two murdered um you don't build a big trailer contraption like that and only end up kidnapping what a total of four women so the actual number that he probably did is way 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 higher and a bunch of women at the time just thought they had a bad nightmare when in actuality yeah because of this they gave him a total of 224 years in jail because they just gave him the max for everything they could like oh what's that you got a ticket four years ago looks like that's 10 years added on buddy they in the meantime also arrested david's wife as well as his friend who was the husband of one of the aforementioned victims. The friend is going up for parole this year actually, and the wife was released from jail in 2019. David himself was sentenced again to the 224 years and then driven to jail to give another interrogation and testimony and then died of a heart attack before the interrogation even began. So yeah, this other guy may get out and she got out, but David's dead and I've got to look on the bright side of something. And that'll do it for what is the third part of the serial killer iceberg. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, <laughs> I, I know that like people are really enjoying this and I think it's really cool too and I like it. Um, there is a lot of research that goes into this though. I try to be very like inclusive and get all the, I guess, cool facts that I can for all of these killers uh, in order to talk about them at length because I think it's really interesting and I think it's just uh, really neat to like look at some of the most depraved members of society. And I've said this in a lot of videos, but I want to emphasize again, we are looking at the worst of the worst. And I know it can get bad, but I just want to assure you, um, it like what we are we are looking at the bottom of the pit, right? And there's so much above it. And the world can be such a beautiful, wonderful place. And I don't mean to get you down with this. Um, so thank you for watching. And part of that beauty is you guys clicking on the video of someone who's just doing this for fun and having a great time and managing to um, just th the fact that I can consider myself like successful with this channel blows my mind. Uh, and it's all thanks to you all. So sincerely, thank you for watching. I want to stress again, the second channel uh, the new second channel, Window Gaming. I've got a video it out on. Uh, by the time this video goes up, there may be two videos on it. I'm not sure yet. Um, but I want to do more on there, and I think it'll be fun. So link in the description for that. I hope you check it out, and thank you to everyone who already has. It means a lot. Um, but like I said, I, I'm just having fun here, and I want to have fun there. And it's all thanks to you guys. So thank you for watching. Thank you to my subscribers. I think we're up to like 449,000 now, which again... I never thought I'd get to 10, much less here, and it means the most. So thank you all so much for that. Thank you to all my patrons. Thank you to my top tier patrons here. You guys are awesome. Um, just being able to support me not only with your views and your time, but with your finances. Uh, and it means a lot, and I really do appreciate it. So thank you. I've got some cool excitements. I've got some cool announcements on the way that I'm, I'm holding my tongue on for now. Um, but there's already some cool videos in the pipeline, some getting edited right now that you'll see shortly after this. So I hope you're looking forward to that. I hope you enjoy, but nevertheless, above all else, thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!